Uh, what I'm going to talk about is something that probably most of you know very little about uh, the details. You may have heard some of the things that I'm going to talk about. How many here know what an excitotoxin is? Okay. So it's nice to see that so many people are coming to hear about something and have no idea what it's even about. But you're curious because primarily uh, the second part of the title of the book, Excitotoxin, The Taste That Kills. And I'm sure you're curious as to what taste can kill you. Well, we're going to find out. You could uh, dim most of the lights except for this one over the podium. You could see the slides maybe a little better. Uh, an excitotoxin is exactly what its name says. Uh, most people know what a toxin is. A toxin is a poison. Uh, exciting is something that excites you, causes excitation. And an excitotoxin basically is any substance that causes brain cells to become very excited and they start firing their impulses very rapidly. And they fire so rapidly that this cell will become exhausted and die. This occurs over about an hour's period. So if you take some brain cells and you put them in a Petri dish and you expose them to these excitotoxic substances, the cells start firing real rapidly. But they look normal during that one hour period. You look at them, they look perfectly healthy. And then at one hour, they just suddenly die. And this is going on in your brain if you take these excitotoxins into your body. It does the same things. There's particular cells inside of your brain that will become very excited. And they'll become excited to the point that they'll die. But it's not all the cells of the brain. It's just particular ones. Now, uh, in Matthew 13, 34 through 37, it says, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And we're going to find out how that pertains to the subject of excitotoxins. Because at the present time, excitotoxins, the subject of excitotoxins, is the hottest idea and item going in the field of neuroscience, that is the study of the brain and the nervous system. Every journal that has anything to do with the brain and the nervous system is filled with articles about excitotoxins. Uh, every research laboratory that is dealing with the diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's disease, all these terrible diseases of the brain, the number one thing that they're talking about is excitotoxins. But with all this flurry of activity and the fact that they have named this the decade of the brain, uh, that we're going to concentrate all this money and all this effort in studying how the brain works and solving the problem of these terrible diseases of the brain. Despite all of that, hardly anyone in the general public has ever heard the word excitotoxin. And that's not by accident. It's because the number one source of excitotoxins in our society is in your food. And it's not in your natural food. It's being added to your food by the industry that processes food. And they're adding it in very large concentrations. And we'll see exactly what these excitotoxin substances are uh, and the various deceiving methods they use to keep you from knowing they're there and what they try to do to those of us who are trying to tell you they're there and what they do to you. Now, what I have found out since I wrote this book, and this book was a, a, a very difficult thing to write. I went through a long period before I ever decided to do it because I was warned by people who had dealt in this area before when I told them I wanted to write a book. One of the persons who first tried to start in this crusade, he said, well, that's fine, but let me warn you of something. You're going to come under attack like you've never dreamed of. He said, Ralph Nader, most of you, I assume, know who Ralph Nader, the consumer advocate. 
he became interested in this at one point, just one segment of it. He was so browbeaten and so destroyed by this industry, he said he would never touch it again. And I talked to his attorney, Jim Turner, who told me this story. He said they were through with it. Now, this is a man that took on General Motors. Um, so it's, it's something that is not a, a light thing to take. So I was warned. Said they will, they have hundreds of millions of dollars they will spend to keep you from getting this story out. They will threaten a lawsuit. Uh, they will intimidate you in every way imaginable. So if you do this, be prepared. And so when I wrote the book, I said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this argument so tight so well referenced that no one can refute it reasonably. So I spent a long time going through hundreds and hundreds of research papers, uh, interviewing the person who coined the term excitotoxin. And uh, then I wrote the book. And ironically, all these terrible things that were supposed to happen never came about, except a couple of times. But I was able to handle that because I had some secrets that they didn't know. That God let me know about. Um, interestingly, no major publication will write about this. Your major magazines will not carry stories about it. I've never been interviewed by a major magazine. I've had 60 minutes called me and wanted to do a story and spiked it. That means they cut it out. I had a, a writer for the Wall Street Journal editorial page who dared to write about how the story was spiked, and they took him off the editorial page and put him in a non-public office. Um, had one of the talk programs that's kind of like hard copy that's no longer around. They did an interview. We did a set up the story. The reporter worked with me. They fired her and canceled the program. Um, the Chicago Tribune newspaper, when I did my first big conference on excitotoxins, uh, the reporter was sitting in the audience. I presented the case for excitotoxin dangers. He attentively listened, and he told the person next to him, who happened to be a friend of mine, that this is the most unbelievable thing I've ever heard in my life. He said, this is terrifying. When the article came out in the Chicago Tribune, he quoted some of the things I've said, and then the rest of it was quoting the industry representative, which said things that the writer knew was not true. And so I wrote him a letter. And I said, you said in the audience, and you heard the, all of the evidence I had, scientific evidence, that their reputation and defense of its safety was not true, yet you still wrote this article. I said, I can't tell you what to write, and I know the pressure you're under, but you're going to have to live with the thought of all the damage you've done to children, pregnant women, everyone in this country because of what you've done. And it's because his newspaper was heavily advertised in by uh, General Mills and all the food manufacturers in Michigan. Um, so there's enormous pressure to keep this story quiet. Luckily, I've been on the 700 Club several times. They have carried the banner in this. I've been on about seven times. Uh, hard copy did a thing on the NutraSuite and the pilots, airline pilots that were drinking NutraSuite that were having seizures. They were becoming so confused they couldn't figure out how to land their airplanes. We had one pilot who just totally could not figure out, and his co-pilot had to land the plane. Uh, there's over 600 pilots now who have come secretly to organizations to tell their stories of the problems with NutraSuite. Um, I've done about 40 syndicated radio programs. That's basically the way we're getting this story out is through the radio programs and the 700 Club. Uh, they're the only people. And the, the ones that are most interested, I find, are the Christian radio stations because they're not afraid. Uh, health food magazines generally will not touch this story because they sell these things in their health food stores 
uh, and call it health food. Now, a lot of things in the health food store are fine, but they're putting some items in there that are excitotoxins. It's a big industry, and so there's a lot of pressure to keep this story quiet. Now, let's go a little bit into the history of excitotoxicity, how all of this came about. Uh, in Japan, they uh, used a flavoring substance for their food called kombu, or sea tangle. And this is a seaweed. When you dry it, uh, you can grind it up, put it in your food, and it greatly enhances the taste of the food. And that's been used for a thousand years. No one really knew why it en enhanced the taste of food. Uh, until 1908, when a research chemist by the name of Aokita examined kombu, and he discovered that the taste-enhancing compound was glutamate. You may have heard of monosodium glutamate and MSG. Well, that's the active compound, glutamate. So he realized that glutamate had a great potential to enhance the taste of foods. So he made a, a friendship with a Suzuki spice company owner, Suzuki, and together they formed another company called, uh, called Ajinomoto. The Ajinomoto, which means essence of taste, uh, this company began to manufacture monosodium glutamate, or MSG. By 1933, they were producing about 10 million pounds of MSG and putting it in the food. Now, MSG is a much higher concentration of glutamate than in kombu. Uh, so they were suddenly flooding their society with very high concentrations of monosodium glutamate. During World War II, or right after World War II, when we had some of the rations from the Japanese soldiers, they realized that their rations tasted far better than our rations. And so the Quartermaster Corps looked into it and found out, well, the reason it tasted so much better was because of MSG. And they called a conference in 1948 and invited all the major food manufacturers, Libby and Continental and General Mills and Borden, uh, Campbell's, were all invited to this conference. And the quartermasters told them, we have discovered an incredible taste-enhancing compound called monosodium glutamate, or MSG. Well, the major food manufacturers had problems with packaging their foods. They found out, well, we cooked it, it after it sits a while or it's in the can, it loses some of its taste. Uh, it developed some of the tin-type taste from out of the uh, can, so it has this tinny type taste, and we, so this would be an answer, and they found that it would remove all those bad tastes, it would restore and even magnify the taste of the food, so it's just scrumptious. You put MSG in a soup, it's the most delicious soup you'll ever eat, because it, en it enhances the taste by stimulating certain cells in the brain and the tongue. So from 1948 to 1956, these food processors were adding tremendous amounts of this monosodium glutamate to our food. And they assumed it was safe because an amino acid, uh, one of the breakdown products of a protein, so they said, well, it's a nutrient, it must be safe, but no one tested it. So from 1948 to 1957, it was being added even to baby foods because the baby food manufacturer said, oh, let's get the babies to eat, so we'll put it in the baby food. Well, then in 1957, two ophthalmology residents uh, did a research project, and they were studying a rare eye disease uh, in immature mice, and so I mean in humans, so they would use some immature mice, and they fed them monosodium glutamate. This is the only picture I could find of an ophthalmologist, so <laughs> <laughs> I hope there's no ophthalmologist I'm offending of. So in 1957, Lucas and Newhouse, two ophthalmologists, they did this experiment. And what they found to their surprise was that the monosodium glutamate totally destroyed all the nerve cells in the retina of the eye, just wiped them out. And so they wrote up their project, put it in a journal, but it was a rather obscure ophthalmology journal, so hardly anyone read it. And so it sat there for another 10 years uh, until 1960, 